Please pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. From the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, the lectionary suggested gospel reading for this, the second Sunday in Advent. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was ruler of Galilee and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Ituria, and Trachonitis and Licinius, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It starts with a very special specific historical reference in the 15th year of a particular emperor, Tiberius. During the reign when a certain person on the other side of the Mediterranean, Pilate, was governor, and he was ruler over that region, referring to the indigenous ruler, Herod, and another was in charge of a different place during the priesthood of two specific people under that emperor, under that governor, under that king during that reign, Annas and Caiaphas, the word of the Lord came. And that's the way it always happens. When the word of the Lord comes, it always comes in a certain year during the reign, under the leadership, during the priesthood of somebody who is in charge. It always comes, you see, in a particular process, in a particular place. It comes in a specific moment in human history. A specific time when some specific person is in power, and likely you may be geographically quite distant from them, and they may not even have heard of you or your community, and they may not even be benevolent to you or your community. When we don't know fully what is going to happen to us and often wonder what is going to come of us, that's when the Word of God comes. In the fifth day of the twelfth month, of the year 2021, the church remembers how Luke's gospel says, away from the capital of Rome, away from the city of Jerusalem, along the banks of the river Jordan, out in the wilderness, really, John the baptizer was telling those who would listen, you people need to repent. Repentance was the order of the day, and it's the order of the day for the church around the world on this Sunday as we hear the text again that we all need to repent because the word of the Lord calls us to repentance, to make the crooked straight, the mountains low, the valleys high, and all of us look for God's salvation. On the journey towards Christmas, the church remembers the news of those who gathered in the beginning of Jesus, the prophets. We remember the nativity, the shepherds, the angels, the stable, Mary and Joseph. We'll remember that tonight. We'll remember even the journey of the Magi to come and be present. But you know who won't be there at the living nativity tonight? John the Baptist. <laughs> we don't have him in our nativity typically, do we? He's just usually not there. But the Gospels, on the contrary, have him show up every time. Why do they keep inviting this guy to Christmas dinner? John the Baptist's stories are not drawn from the infancy, but nevertheless, they're a part of the prelude as the Bible brings it to us to Jesus, a prelude to his adult ministry. He is, after all, Jesus' cousin, and in Luke's gospel, he's there as an infant at the beginning. I've made such a stink about this that one of my friends, Larry Landshrew, gave me something. 
he gave me a John the Baptist that I could put at my nativity scene. <laughs> so I'm going to ask if you'd put that on the communion table. And when we set up the nativity with the Chris Bonds, we'll bring John the Baptist and add him to the nativity this time. He's going to have a figure there as well. He comes at a particular historical period, very precisely delineated by Luke. John comes not out of his own volition. He doesn't come because he thinks this would be fun. He comes because he has to. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John. Jeremiah says when that happens, it's like a fire in your bones. Another vernacular I often hear that people use say, God laid this on my heart. Or even more commonly, I've heard you talk about it saying, something told me, something told John, the word of God came to John to call the people to get ready for what God was doing, to prepare the way. And how were they to, to do that? John said, through repentance. Through repentance and the forgiveness of sins. He went into all the region around the Jordan in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance through the forgiveness of sins. Great. Merry Christmas. Thank you. But of course, he was right. Again and again, the scriptures teach us that if you're seeking to get ready to prepare yourself to draw into the presence of the Holy One, what is prudent, what is helpful, what is required is less about holly and ivy and more about repentance. You remember repentance, don't you? Change your ways. Or literally from the Greek word metanoia, to turn around. Or perhaps even more directly from the English vernacular, cut it out. Bill Wallace's favorite translation was, stop it. Stop it, he used to say. That's what repentance means. And return. Return home. Home to the pattern of God's good life. So the journey through Advent means that we have to put some things behind us. We have to put some things behind us and turn towards what God is calling us to. John preaches a baptism of repentance, which means he preached a, a sacrament, a ritual, a specific act which was to be a sign, washing with water. And he called for people to come forward from that sign and then live in a new way, to live differently, to live now, today, like people who belong to God. What should that living look like? The people asked him because they heard his call to change. And they came forward, many, prompted by the Spirit, responded to that call to repent, to change the manner of their living. And so they asked him, what should this new living look like, John, as we prepare ourselves for the approach of God? Forgiveness, he said. The first ingredient Luke reports he told them was forgiveness. And it's a two-way street. They're the live like people who believe that God was forgiving them from their sins, people who were now reconciled to God. Forgiveness, when you embrace it, always brings engagement with the purposes of God. Indeed, even commitment and enthusiasm for them. John said, begin with receiving forgiveness yourself and then live as people who preparing for God are forgiving others. What do you do in the journey of Advent? Stop holding grudges. Do not worse wounds. Do not let a root of bitterness grow in your heart. John proclaimed a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Do you want to prepare yourself for the coming of the Holy One of God? Then get over it. Move on. Engage with the constructive purposes of God at hand. Receive and practice forgiveness. But how shall we live this way? The people asked John the Baptist. Well, here's a start. Don't kill each other. Quit imagining killing each other. You know what I'm talking about. I'm going to kill him. Quit imagining that. It seems a little funny, and I've said it before. I have to say it, I think, about once a year. But it's serious, especially this week in America. 
We don't kill each other as Christians. We don't kill each other. Stop it. How shall we get ready to approach the presence of God? Straighten up. I remember a Christmas from my own childhood when everyone in our family, family of five, uh, and it was to become a family of six, but the last one hadn't arrived yet. We were a family of five at that point, three boys, and we were all about the ages of these children over here. And everybody in the family came down with the flu. And I don't mean just a, <clears throat> I have the flu. No, I mean a full, put you on your back, nauseated, chills, uh, I can't do anything kind of flu. Mom and dad and the three boys, me, one of them, were so sick. And there was no one to take care of us. And in the irony of providence, mom and dad got sick first. Dad, being a pastor, tried to drag himself to church functions that he thought were absolutely necessary, but he stopped being able to do that, and nobody wanted him there. And mom, well, she started out feeling a little well enough to do some decorating, but then things just started looking pretty bleak, and she couldn't get up out of the bed either. And as a boy, what was I concerned about? I was concerned that we wouldn't be able to have Christmas. And so we three boys, unsupervised, for about three days, turned the house upside down. It looked like chaos, what Luke called last week dissipation and drunkenness. <laughs> Left to our own TV dinners and uh, sugary cereals and uh, getting out everything that we wanted to get out, we were sinners without hope. And we were worried about how we would have Christmas. And then a prophet from the wilderness arrived. My grandma Jones came over from Tampa and stayed with us through Christmas. I remember when she rang the doorbell, we boys didn't know she was coming. I remember clearly the image of opening the door and seeing her there. She had on a long brown flannel coat, and she had a, a fur that was fashionable at that time that had an animal of some kind as the collar, a furry animal. And she looked at the three of us and looked at the house and she said, you boys, you boys, you boys. And I knew it was a call to repentance. <laughs> but she didn't kill us. Instead, she disinfected us. She baptized us with Lysol and scrubbed us down with a brush and made us pick up the house again, straighten it up under her supervision. And then when we got the flu, as we inevitably did, because God is just, and this is the way the flu progresses, she nursed us. She nursed us to health and was an angel of comfort. She took our temperatures and put cold washcloths on our foreheads and fed us liquid jello and chicken and star soup and saltine crackers with butter. And I remember her presence is a strong, straightening comfort to me. She was a physically comfortable person with dark hair and soft hugs that sometimes smelled good, and her voice was commanding yet quiet, strong and confident. She didn't take over, but she certainly took care of us and straightened our, us up. And that year, her presence, her order, her comfort to us, her work, that year, it was the great gift of Christmas. That's the way I remember Christmas from that year. God comes at Christmas to comfort. So John the Baptist quotes Isaiah, Comfort you, comfort you, my people, says Isaiah. But God calls for us to repent, to change our actions, to forgive one another. God comes in Jesus Christ to care for us in the midst of our need. How shall we get ready to approach the presence of God? Decorate, yes. Sing praise, share joy, pray with patience, wait, and practice all of these things. And, and this too, straighten up. The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, practicing a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And this is what it says in the book of the prophet Isaiah. 
Do you hear the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight? Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and rough ways shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The word of the Lord is doing this. Even now, even today, even December 5th of 2021. Amen.